Welcome to the ESC TV News Update. I'm Candace Baylor, and here are this week's headlines. For the fourth year in a row, Emory Henry College was named a 2020 Best Value School by one of the top online resources for students to find colleges that provide a valuable education. The recognition is given to high quality, affordable colleges with strong endorsements from the majority of the students and alumni. Those coming to college in the fall will have a new major to choose from. Emory Henry announced it will offer a Bachelor of Science degree in Engineering Science. The program will feature shadowing and internship opportunities. Successful students will be prepared for careers in a variety of engineering fields or may choose to work at the interface of engineering and positions focused on technical writing, marketing, and project management. In other news, the Emory Henry Athletic Department recently announced that they will be adding men's and women's wrestling starting in the fall of 2020. Pete Hansen has been named the first ever head coach for both teams. Hansen will be leaving his role as assistant coach with the Emory Henry football team to lead the new program. Hansen wrestled during his collegiate career at Southern Virginia University, earning All-American status after finishing fifth in his weight class. Hansen tells us that he is currently recruiting both high school and current Emory Henry students for next year's team. Starting February, the on-campus radio station WEHC is beginning their annual fundraising drive. Students, faculty, staff, and the community are all being asked to donate. Money is raised from the week-long drive will help support the operations and special projects. WEHC is 9,000 watts and reaches most of Southwest Virginia. Finally, it has been a busy Black History Month on the Emory Henry campus. But there is still time for the community to attend some events organized by the college's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Center. You can visit www.ec.edu to see a list of all the events. The college continues to seek ways to support every student in finding their voice and creating a positive impact at Emory Henry College and in the community and the world. That's all the news for this week. I'm Candace Baylor. Next, David Eldridge will have our future interview. Thanks, Candace. I'm joined here with Claire Carter, a first year transfer student who's employed by FCNL, the Friends Committee on National Legislation, which to my understanding is a uh, Quaker-based national organization centered out of DC, yep. which focuses on uh, employing and training lobbyists of political issues Mm -hmm. Feel free to elaborate if I missed yeah. some points. Yeah, they're, they're a peace lobbying organization mm -hmm. and they focus on, they have a lot of lobbyists that they have employed in D.C. Mm -hmm. and they go to the Hill and they talk to congressmen, um, congress, congress people about the issues that they're lobbying on. They lobby about a lot of different issues. They have an immigration section, they have a nuclear, power, uh, n nuclear weapons um, mm -hmm lobbying section and climate change uh, they lobby a bunch of different issues and specifically the issue that has been most focused on at least in your time with the organization has been gun violence prevention am i correct to say that yes now as we know the issue of gun control is a very hot button you know tends to grab some polarizing reactions from people but gun violence prevention seems a little harder to uh to debate what exact legislation is being pushed that differentiates gun violence prevention from gun control? Yeah, sure. Um, so maybe I should just tell a little bit about like what I actually do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I am employed by the Friends Committee on National Legislation mm -hmm. um, to lobby Congress people in district. So yeah. I lobby. <coughs> excuse me, uh, Senator Warner, Senator Kane, and Congressman Griffith here in Southwest Virginia. And I, I am lobbying them on gun violence prevention issues. So the two uh, pieces of legislation that I am lobbying them on, um, they are Senate Bill 42, which is the Universal Background Checks Bill. Mm -hmm. That's if I'm lobbying Senator Warner or Senator Kane. Or it's H.R. 1236, which is the Extreme Risk Protection Order Bill, if I'm lobbying Congressman Griffith. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, how would you say that to, could these lobby visits, at least in my understanding, 
you gather people from the local area who are interested in or invested in this issue. How would you say the turnout has been um, starting on the immediate surrounding area of Emory and Henry campus, as well as perhaps the Abingdon, Meadowview area, and then just the Southwest Virginia area? Sure, yeah. Um, so to get people to lobby with me, it, ha it was a little bit of a struggle at first, just because um, I think when when people do do hear gun violence prevention, they automatically think um, a buyback or yeah. assault weapons ban, yeah. which is not popular in this region. Um, but that's not what I'm lobbying for. I'm mm -hmm. lobbying for two very specific pieces of legislation, universal background checks and extremist protection orders. So after that was made more clear, it's easier to get people out. Um, so at school, I have gotten, I've gotten a good turnout of students. Um, but then the real turnout, I think, has been in the surrounding communities. I did Ooh. a gun violence vigil um, commemorating the anniversary, uh, anniversary of the Sandy Hook shooting mm -hmm. in December. And a lot of people from the community came, and they put their email addresses down to go lobby with me, to, to go lobby Congressman Griffith's office with me. And so I got, I got a lot of people to go with me on that trip because they came to the gun violence vigil. And that, that was mostly, there were some students, but it was mostly people um, from the community. So community members' engagement has been pretty high. Yeah. Yeah, so how would, going back to the student population, which of course is, you know, the main, I guess, if you're on campus, the easiest to reach out to, mm -hmm. would you say the people who have been involved on your lobbying trips, does their investment tend to come from a personal, passionate stance on the issue, or is it an interest in lobbying, or is it a lot of sociology and political science majors, or just in your gauging of the crowd? Yeah, um, so I think that it's a mix. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the times when some people, when I advertise it, I advertise it as a lobbying opportunity, something that you can put on your resume, uh, and yeah. that gets some people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, and because this issue isn't super popular, Definitely. sometimes I come out of the gate with, this is, we're, we're talking about universal background checks and extremist protection orders. Sometimes I come out of the gate with, this is a good lobbying experience, and then I get them more on board after they have come to the training and know a little bit more about what it's about. But the passion that comes with going into lobby visits is really what makes a lobby visit. The most important part of a lobby visit is why you're there, your personal story. So there, do, there does have to be some reason why they're there, whether it be that they originally just wanted to be in it because they wanted to experience lobbying or it's because they had a personal experience with gun violence. Yeah, yeah. And going into, so you're part of FCNL, or employed by them. Would you say you're on the younger end of the spectrum for people they employ? Because I know it's national and it draws right. a lot of interest. Uh, would you say you're one of the younger activists? Yeah. Um, or lobbyists? Well, so my job is technically called the Advocacy Corps. So mm. I'm part of the Advocacy Corps class of 2019 to 2020. To 2020. Okay. So there are 20 of us, mm -hmm. and they're all under the age of 30. Um, I think that the oldest is in her late 20s, but they're all young people and they're lobbying in district in their states. So in that regard, I'm not the youngest employed FCNL employee. Um, they are a Quaker-based organization, so even if the people that they employ even if the people that are part of the organization aren't necessarily people they employ, a lot of the people in their organization are tend to be older, um, oh. over 50. But the people that they employ, their lobbyists, um, the people on staff, are usually millennials or um, our generation. Awesome. One thing I wanted to touch on about being sort of a younger activist, that can sometimes be sort of like stigmatized, carry a bit of a connotation being a young activist, especially college campus, liberal arts schools. Has that influenced any of your lobby visits from how you're oh. received by staffers or? Um, I think that the first lobby visit that I went on, especially, uh, she kind of dismissed us a little bit, thinking that we were kids. Um, yeah. The fact is, though, that we're voting adults, so they should definitely take us seriously. Whether or not we're, we're under the age of 30, 18 is the voting age. So that's the bottom line, really. Whether or not they take me seriously is irrelevant. Hmm. Well, very interesting. Well, thank you, Claire, for meeting with me today. Yeah, thank you. And on that note, toss it over to uh, Luke with the sports update. Hello, I'm Luke Montalbano bringing you this week's sports update. 
There are a total of eight home competitions this weekend, so let's jump right into it. The men's basketball team hosted Shenandoah University on Saturday. They would honor their two seniors, Colin Molden and Jamie Clark. On offense, Molden leaves the fast break and finds Anthony Williams for the layup. Williams would have a game-high 27 points to, to lead both teams. And on the other end of the floor for Shenandoah, Jalen Hill finds Ethan Diffie for the and one. This game would go back and forth all game long. The crowd really getting into this one. And then Colin Molden on offense drives in for an easy layup. Molden finished his final game at the Bob Johnson Court with 23 points and 11 assists. The Wasps would win the game by a final score of 88 to 84, and they will play Ferrum College in the first round of the ODAC tournament on Wednesday. The women's team also held their senior day, honoring their three seniors as they hosted Bridgewater College in, their, in a one versus three matchup. Kali Cooper uh, bosses the ball and finds Sydney McKinney in for the layup. McKinney would finish the game with 16 points on her own. On the other end of the floor for Bridgewater, Lindsay Estas would stick a three, building Bridgewater's lead up to nine points in the competition. And then on the other end of the floor, Josie Salier would find Peyton Williams for an easy layup. Peyton Williams finished the game with 20 points and 13 rebounds. And then Williams will, on offense will find Callie Hatterer for the layup. The Wasp would win the game by a final score of 84 to 79 to clinch the first seed in the ODAC tournament for the second time in three seasons, and they will host the University of Lynchburg in Salem on Thursday. Moving on to the Diamond, the baseball team had their home opener as they had a two-game series on Saturday with Mount St. Joseph University. Mount St. Joseph's Ryan Pauley would hit an RBI, bringing home Ian Mustard and Brandon Turner, which tied the game up at three apiece in the third inning. And then later on, and then later on, on offense, Chandler Kiesel hits a blooper Chandler Kiesel hits a blooper into right field, bringing home Caleb Wallace. The, the bats were flying at, at Emory and Henry on Saturday. And then later on in, in the afternoon, Halen, Hayden Milley hits a home run deep into center field. And the Wasps would take both games 4-3 to three and 12-1. to one. The softball team hosted a pair of matchups on Saturday. They welcomed in Salem College. Alex Thomas got things going with the single to right field as the, bat, bat, wasp were, the bats were also flying on the softball field. And then Leanne Toller, uh, later on in the game, uh, runs, hits a blooper or a scrounder in the infield, but outruns the defense to get safely on the first base. And then pitcher Cam Bellard forced a grounder in the game. The Wasp would take both games 3-2 to two and 9-1. to one. And then on Sunday, the Wasp would host 8th nationally ranked Christopher Newport University. Emory and Henry would start the second game with a big RBI single, and the Wasps would have the fourth, a 3 to 2 lead in that game. And then Christopher Newport's Caitlin Hassett hits a home run to left field, building their big lead in the first game of the doubleheader. And then an RBI double from Emory and Henry's Allison Stedman would uh, generate some momentum for Emory and Henry. Stedman will be on set later on with Cam Durr, and that Stedman bringing home two runs there. And Stedman will come up big on defense as she'll hustle from third base to get the out. Coach Forrester loves it, but the Wasps will lose both games, 9-2 and 4-3. That will do it for this week's sports update. I'm Luke Montalbano. Let's throw it over to Cam Durr for this week's sports interview. I'm Cam with this week's sports interview. On set today I have junior third baseman, Allison Stedman. Allison, thanks for being here. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Um, so we started the we've started the um, season off four and four, and the first game of the season we went we shut out the number fifteen team in the nation. Um, since then we've played three uh, two other um, ranked teams. Um, what is some of the things that the team's doing well right now? I think one of the things that the team is doing well is like playing against these teams and knowing that we can hang with them. Um, I do think we are talented enough and we do have enough like ability to beat these teams and to be one of the top teams in the nation. So I feel like we, we do a good job of like knowing that we are that good. From a player's perspective, um, what can be done mindset-wise going into these uh, games against these big teams? 
Um, I think mindset wise we can do better at knowing that we are that good but also knowing that they're just another team that we have to step on the field with and that we can really like show who we are and what we're about and know that we're that good. And heading into Arizona next week uh, we're going to be facing more big teams, big mm -hmm. name teams, ranked teams. Um, what do you expect from playing in that tournament? Um, I think it's going to be a really, really great experience. Um, it's really cool to be one of the top 24 teams in the nation that get invited to the NFCA Classic, and um, which also 21 out of the 24 teams in the last tournament they had made it to the NCAA tournament. So I, I think it's a really big honor that we got picked for that tournament and got invited, like, because that's really big for our program. Um, but I think what we expect is to be able to hang. Because uh, I think that we really, we really have to go in and know that we are good enough to play and good enough to hang with those teams that are supposed to be the best in the nation. Because we are too. Um, is there going to be any fun activities or anything other than softball going on out west? Um, I think so. We're supposed to be going on a. Some people don't know this yet, but we're supposed to be going on a UTV tour around the desert and maybe to a couple of zoos and definitely having fun in Arizona. <laughs> It'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. um, and once we get back from Arizona, you know, obviously we have a pretty tough schedule mm -hmm. in the ODAC. Um, there's a few ranked teams there mm -hmm. as well. Um, how do you think playing a tough schedule pre-season or pre-conference play is beneficial to us in conference play? Um, I think it's beneficial because we like are prepared because like some people go and get those um, preseason ODAC games out of the way and they're under their belt and then they come to ODAC and they're shocked about the competition we have in the ODAC. Um, I'm a firm believer that the ODAC is the SEC of the D3. Um, I think anybody at any time can win and so I feel like we playing comp tough competition before ODACs is a very good like prepare for us. So. And we were picked second um, in the preseason poll for mm -hmm. our conference. Um, what, what do you think you can look forward to in the conference? Um, my biggest thing that I'm looking forward to is finally beating Wesleyan. Um, I think that, which in the past years, they've gotten 100 votes for a lot of years for the preseason poll. And this year, they got 99, so that gives us a little bit of hope. Um, and we picked second, but we're going to be first this year, so I, I'm really excited to see where we go up. And obviously we have a game this weekend, mm -hmm. so um, it's against Meredith. They're a non-ranked team. What do you think, how can we match up against them and coming off of a, a couple of losses against um, CNU, what can, we, what can we look forward to in the game this weekend? Um, I think you're going to see a lot of Emory Henry softball because that's what we're about. We're a, um, we do face some adversity every every now and then, and we are all resilient. That's one of our team goals and team core values. And so when we are resilient, we bounce back, and we go out and play in Henry softball, and we get a dub. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, Allison. Thanks for being here, and I uh, look forward to being on the field with you this yeah, weekend. me too. <laughs> That's all for this week's sports interview. I'm Cam Durr. Well, Cam, this is a little different of a setting for our outro coming along. Yeah, I like all the work that's been put in and once we get the final touches of getting it painted, it's going to look great and you'll be seeing it a lot more on EHC TV. Speaking of which, I thought it was a good episode and I really loved your interview. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, we're, um, we're a close-knit group, yeah. you know, and I, I love having some of my teammates on. <laughs> well, your chemistry showed here, and I'm sure it shows on the field. Definitely, and I had no idea that such political views were going on on campus. Right? I know. You dig a little deeper and you find some really cool stuff. Yeah. Well, I think that's it for this week's EHC TV. I'm Cam Durr. And I'm David Eldridge, signing off.